Okay, for our final talk tonight, um, this very packed evening, I'm sorry for having to cut questions short, but um, I'm sure, so like I say, there'll be time over the pizzas and stuff. Got James Singleton, um, kind of worked in .NET space for a long while, I believe, and obviously, um, sort of like .NET Core is something that kind of came out probably around 18 months or so ago, the, ver the, ver the, the, yeah, the, ver the version one. Um, been a big change with .NET Core version two. It's kind of like just gone really um, sort of like kind of public release and um, there's some real opportunities here, right, for people that have been in the Microsoft space to, to kind of start doing things a little bit differently. And I think uh, James will kind of give a little bit of an overview of that and the performance aspects of it. So I'll just hand over to James for our last talk. Oh, thank you, everyone. Can you hear me? Not being even mic. Um, right. So I'm James. As loads of people, who's heard of ASP.NET Core? Who's actually used it? Who's used the second version? Okay. Right. So <laughs> got everyone's hands down. Right. So we'll uh, we'll do like a high level thing. I'll, I'll explain what it is. I won't go too deep, and I hopefully have time for a demo. So, what is ASP.NET Core? Uh, it's the open source version of ASP.NET. It's a rewrite. So, you know, it's, it's a web application framework. So, let's go for it. It's free. Okay, fair enough. Most web application frameworks are free, right? It's also open, but properly open source. So, previously, a lot of companies would be like, hey, it's open, here's the source code, but we're not going to like let you make changes, and we're not going to accept your contributions. But it's all different now. They're not just looking down on you. It's more a question of, like, everyone's invited. Come on in. Send us a pull request. If you want to fix something, great. So this is kind of a standard with web applications, uh, frameworks in any case. Uh, and Microsoft have got on board now. They're like, we've got to play the game. If we want to compete with the other web app frameworks, we've got to do the same thing. Firstly, naming is hard. So this is a famous quote you might have heard from before from uh, the late Bill Carson of Netscape, and someone else has riffed on it because it's only the first bit of the tears. So, so there's only two hard things in computer science, uh, cache invalidation, naming things, and off by one errors. So got a little laugh out of that one. <laughs> so uh, here's a few examples of naming things. So I don't know if anyone's familiar with the bank. Monzo, they, they had to change their name because someone else had it. Uh, probably less familiar with this. It's a piece of IoT hardware. They had to change their name. Uh, so yeah, naming is hard, but ASP.NET is a brand, so Microsoft stick with it. Um, it was originally called ASP.NET 5, and then they rebranded it to ASP.NET Core. So this is how it kind of fits together. So ASP.NET 4 on the left is the Windows-only framework that runs on top of .NET framework for. And ASP.NET Core, version 2 is the new one, but uh, version 1 is the same. And that runs on .NET Core or .NET Framework, and it's the cross-platform one that runs on all the different systems. Hope that is clear. Uh, I lifted this out of my book, so it's based on something that Scott Hanselman made for the previous version. Versioning is also hard. You know, if naming's hard enough, then versioning is, is a nightmare. So we had Core 1. That, although it was a version 1, maybe not so much a version 1. I, I won't go into the details of how they did Alpha, 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 Beta, Beta, release candidate. Yay, another release candidate. Let's change everything, and then we'll do V1. So version 1 was kind of a beta, really, if we're honest. Uh, version 2 is kind of a real version 1. It's more of a 1.2, but they wanted to <laughs> relaunch it. So. Yeah, it, it was originally version 1.2, and then they said, okay, it's a major version change. So for good reason as well. It's not just a rebranding. It's, it's massively increased in scope. Uh, so let's talk about some features. So ASP.NET Core is cross-platform, runs on all the main platforms, uh, command line friendly. So you don't have to download gigabytes of data, install a massive IDE, and do a graphical development. It's you know, a couple of small downloads, one SDK, code editor, and you're up and running. Uh, you can still use IDEs, and there's cross-platform IDEs now. So Visual Studio, obviously, on Windows. 
We've got VS Mac, which is a rebranding of Xamarin Studio, but it has actually increased in scope as well. Uh, you've got Rider from JetBrains, which runs on all the main platforms. Or if you just want something a bit simpler, you've got VS Code, which I will demo later. Uh, it's open source, but not open source as in here's our source code like Apple do. It's open source as in <laughs> please, please contribute. So uh, it's also very high performance, which I think is what resonates with a meetup like this. It's a compiled language. It runs very quick. The benchmarks have been great. And a lot of the performance improvements have come from the community. There's been a lot of people saying, this isn't quick enough for what I'm doing. I'm writing a game. I need this quicker. Uh, it's compiled, uh, but it's not compiled to native machine code by default. Uh, so it's a bit like Java. It runs in a virtual machine. It's bytecode. It's an intermediate language. So you get static typing and all the safety that brings, but you can still move your binaries around and they'll run on any platform. And hopefully, if the demo deities have been appeased, I will demonstrate that after this. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about this as the demo is running. But it's quite easy to package something without having to install anything on your target machines. You say, I want to build a big thing that I just can ship onto something. And I don't need to install anything on it first. It's all self-contained, and it will just run. Uh, and if you want to do native compilation and merging and throwing away what you're not using, you can do that. But I will get on to that. So without further ado, it's time for a demo. <laughs> so let's start with uh, apologies for the backdrop. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's a ninja cat riding a unicorn, obviously. So hopefully my typing at this angle is not too bad. So, so I previously installed the uh, .NET SDK onto this machine. It's like 100 megs, really quick install. So let's create a directory. Move to it. And we're now in here. So the .NET command line tool is what you'll be using to create. This is the way that works on all different platforms. So don't worry about I'm using Windows. It's exactly the same on Mac or Linux. .NET new. And this will give us a list of project templates. These are the defaults. You can install more. Like you can install a Vue.js one if you want. There's loads of things here. So we're going to create a new project. .NET new. And I could do a command line hello world, but that would be a bit dull. So let's do a. <laughs> React Redux app and see how well that works. So this is going to build our application. And it's creating it. All done. I'm not going to bore you with the NPM install because that's really slow. So but that's, that's not .NET. That's Node. So what I'm going to do, here's one. Oh, no. I should probably change directory. Here's one I made earlier. So once I had restored that with npm install, which would go off to the internet and take a long time, uh, you just do .NET run. And then this will restore packages from a local cache if required. It will build your application, and it will spin up a local web server, like so. So then we open our impartial third party browser of choice and go to the local web app. Here we are. So this is a React app using Redux with a back-end web API that is retrieving information here, which I'll show a little bit more in a bit. Uh, but for now, I want to show you the internals of it. So I'm going to open Visual Studio Code with this directory, and we will see what it looks like. So we have some controllers here. We have our client app. So this is a back-end controller. Home controller just serves a view, and it does some server-side rendering to do your initial state. Uh, the client apps are written in TypeScript, which is static JavaScript, and then that gets compiled down with Webpack. So we have two different ways of starting it up on the server and on the client. Uh, we have a sample data controller, which is the API that it was getting that fake weather data from. So it's just generating random values, but normally this would be coming from a database. So what I'm going to show here, hopefully, is a bit of debugging. So I'm going to put a breakpoint here, and then go to debug, and run this. 
So this will be going off to the command line, running the application, should see some output in the bottom there. And then if I refresh it in the browser once it's up and running, it should hit that breakpoint and give us lots of information. I think it'll grab focus when it's done. I need to go to the fetch data one because that's the API. There we go. So it's a web forecast. And we can see what the state of everything is. We can step into it. This is all running on the server. So the same sort of experience you might get in a full IDE like Visual Studio. We can see what things are in there. We continue with that. We can stop that. So the next part of this, if I go back to here, what if we want to take this out now? We've debugged it. We're happy with it. We want to ship it. So we do .NET publish. Now I'm going to do this in the release configuration, which will build everything without debugging, and it will minify things and package it for production. And then I'm going to say a target platform, because I want this to be self-contained. So let's say I want this to run on Linux. And maybe Intel's a bit boring, so I'm going to run this on Linux ARM. So now this is going to go and package this all up into a folder, and it's going to put some platform-specific bootstrappers in there. And then you just copy that to your target platform. Don't have to install anything. It's all there. There are a few prerequisites that you need installing, like libssl and other things, but <laughs> .NET doesn't need to be there. So once this is finished, it's actually the Webpack bit that's taken the time here. It's not the, the .NET bit has actually finished. So, <laughs> so I'll, I'll talk a bit more about the, the native compiler. So this is, although this is publishing for a target platform, it's still not natively compiled. It's just generating some bootstrappers there that will then run that portable binary. Right. So that looks like it's almost done. There we go. So we've published a folder. So let's have a look at what that looks like. So in our binary folder, release, publish. So this folder here, you copy this somewhere else, and it will just run. So if we go properties, it's about 60 meg. Say again. Oh, right. <laughs> here is the part of the demo that is going to go really smoothly. So you may have noticed uh, down here I had a Raspberry Pi. Uh -huh. So I won't bore you with copying files, but I copy the files over, and I run it, and it's here. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> right, so all I did here. It is genuine. We set it up earlier. <laughs> I used apt to install a few prerequisites modify the binary to be executable, and then you just run it. So I'm running demo, which in Unix world is dot slash demo. It doesn't have an extension, because it's an else binary. Uh, and although the Pi is quite slow, it does in fact work. So there is the server up and running. I can change to the browser, and this might take a while. But I don't think F5 worked. Let's try control. So this is still running, and it's a React app, so you know, I can still actually mess about with it whilst it's reloading. Because it's just running the browser. We can see if the, uh, you know, this will hit an API if it's up and running. So the server is spinning up. It's pretty, it might take a bit of a lot of time. But that's why I preload it. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Although Raspberry Pi is slow, it does run it. Thank you very much. I will thank the demo gods later. So let's go back to your presentation. <laughs> Say again. I will tell you about it again. <laughs> right, so that's the demo. And it all went smoothly, thankfully. So um, 
one of the big things with .NET Core 2 is they massively expanded the surface area of the API. They have something called .NET Standard, which is the intersection of Xamarin and uh, .NET and other things, and they, it's sort of a common, if you imagine like a Venn diagram. Uh, so for .NET Core 1, a lot of things weren't supported. It was very hard to find packages that were available for it. Uh, still the case to some extent, you know, if you're using like system.drawing, that's tricky. Um, so I've made a website, well, it's a GitHub repository, but there's a short domain uh, that'll list all like a load of common packages and whether they're supported or not. So check that out, send a pull request if there's something wrong, which there probably is, uh, or if there's something missing, feel free to add it. Uh, I've also got a book, which I should plug. Um, so conveniently on what I'm talking about, it's <coughs> it's the second edition. So it's uh, you know, the first edition was for Donut Core One. This is for ASP Donut Core Two. Uh, it's revised two new chapters: how to get set up on Windows, Mac, Linux, and with Docker. Um, but it's more than just .NET Core, it's a book about making web applications work well. So there's a lot of general stuff in there, things about HTTP2, networking, caching, you know, loads of uh, interesting stuff that's not just specific to .NET Core, even though that's the examples, uh, and the C-sharp examples. But it's a lovely language. There's also things on JavaScript and service workers and things, so it's really sort of general stuff. And that is, that is out imminently. Uh, so thank you very much for listening, and if there are any questions, I'll take them off. Okay, we'll have, whilst my phone doesn't like vibrate telling the food here, we'll do as many questions as we can. And if we've got questions for Saya as well, we'll do those at the same time. So this one, take it for James. Right. I'm going to do a Patrick, and I've got two questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> First one is um, UNOP. Please yeah. explain. Uh, it's just a short domain name that was available at the time. So it doesn't mean anything. It's, There's lots it's of like, four-letter words that are available. Yeah, yeah. It, I know. I guess it's a bit like XKCD or something. It's just the domain name of my blog. OK, that's good enough. Um, <laughs> and core two, penetration into corporate environments. What's the, so Microsoft has always been big corporate mm -hmm. stuff. This seems more IoT focused, a little bit more startup friendly. What's the goal, enterprise level? The goal, well, the goal for Microsoft is to get people using Azure. That's their big focus. Um, so .NET Core, yeah, exactly. So .NET Core 1 was very much a web focused thing. Uh, and then it was kind of a victim of its own success. And they thought, oh, we can use that for this. So now it's not just web, it's IoT, it's command line stuff, it's UWP potentially, and all these other things. Um, and they also bought Xamarin around that time and tried to merge that in. So to answer your question about corporate stuff, I work in a very corporate place at the moment, and we're using .NET Core. So it's you know not for the main thing, but for certainly like little applications and things, it's, it's a lot easier to get up and running with. Again, just to sort of like reiterate that, you know that I work for Ticketmaster and some of the sites that we're doing, um, some of the bits from SeatWave now being re-engineered onto .NET Core, um, and there's a migration going on on a certain platform, and that again is going to be .NET Core 2 running in AWS on Linux. Right? So we're we're really really pushing it um, to, to do that because it's making the most use of. The, basically the developer resources that we had in that part of the business. So um, it's a lot easier transition for them to like carry on using the core of the language that they're familiar with than having to retrain to, to, into a new, um, new language. It depends what you're so, writing. Obviously, if you're yeah. writing like a big sort of WPF desktop app or something, it's not for you. But for web workloads and backend stuff that doesn't have a UI, it's, it's very suitable. Yeah, exactly. I'm just interested the the kind of build to target uh, is that that just generates you know a, a file or folder sort of stuff can it target like a distributions um, package format that would you know, would it write a spec file for instance and then build me an RPM of all the dependencies uh, no okay. <laughs> no uh, you, you wouldn't it currently doesn't work in that manner you wouldn't be able to build like a, a deb or an RPM or something and then put it into your package manager. Um, the way it packages it is it kind of just has this bootloader for the target platform and everything else is portable. 
but there are projects that will make that a lot more native. So there's a .NET native platform they use for UWP at the moment, and they're gonna bring that to .NET Core, which will allow you to actually natively, ahead of time, compile all of the binaries to that target platform, which opens up a lot of interesting things around having a very slow compile to improve the execution, or even doing like profile guided optimization, so running the app, seeing the path that it goes down most and compiling it in the best way for that. And then you can use tools like IL merge to strip out all of the bits you're not even calling to really shrink it down. Yeah. Okay. Is the outputted build for whatever platform you want to go for, are the DLLs ex like identical? Or does it build anything into the DLL that's slightly platform specific? Or is the only difference in the outputted folder, like that initial entry points, like the demo executable file you made yeah, there? I'll, I'll show you the folder. And um, the answer is they usually, yes, .NET DLLs are cross platform, they're byte code, it's an intermediate language, it will run on any platform. There are exceptions to that. Normally, if you're e invoking or calling unmanaged native code, you'll have to say this is for only for a certain platform. Normally that's like x86, 64, or 32-bit, 64-bit, but if you're just in managed runtime world, they are completely portable, and exactly. they get compiled at runtime. That's exactly mm -hmm. why when I, I asked you, can we see the demo folder? I will show you the demo folder then. Because I saw the DLL, and I was like, hang on a second. <laughs> right, so if we had a look in the published folder, client app is just for TypeScript, well, it's JavaScript now, because it's being compiled, but, so all of these, you got a few, platform specific libraries here, these .so files. Demo is your platform specific bootstrapper. Demo DLL is a .NET DLL, but is the same. Yeah. So it's the core runtime, it's the core CLR, it's .NET itself. So there was no .NET installed on the Pi. So because I specified a target runtime, it's made a self-contained package, which means here's your app plus the framework to run it. Yes, but is it actually the app? You're, you're using the word bootstrapper, and then there is a DLL file plus other code. So actually, it's not a self-contained binary. It's not a single binary. Yeah. No, it's a self-contained deployment. Right. So if so you... Just doing uh, all of those files. So it's not, for instance... Go will produce a single binary. Yeah, and the .NET native platform that is being worked on as a native tool chain, that will produce one file, a single file that is natively compiled, and it's just one file, and you copy it, and it runs. So did you get that as part of the .NET CLI build chain? Not currently. It's been delayed. It's a work in progress. Yeah. They currently use it for Windows Store apps, because they have to compile them for certain devices, but they are bringing it to the rest of the, uh, the tool chain. Okay. So presumably, the vast majority of those files will never change unless you update your .NET Core version mm -hmm. your part is here. But next time you build, and you to change your code, next time you build again, it's the only file in there that would be specific to the DLL. Yes. So if you just deploy that, and then your DLL or however many more DLLs mm -hmm. you're building in the future, you can just drop those on. That is the only file to change run the same thing again. Yeah, and this is only one deployment story. There's stories where you have it installed and it shares the framework between multiple apps, and there's a really great Docker uh, sort of deployment story, and they build pre-made containers. So you just say, I want this container and run it. So that, that was a kind of a follow-up what I had to what you were just asking. Like, uh, Do I need to use the mic? Sorry, yeah. sorry, Perry. I'm sorry. Uh, Luke has asked on of whether or not you, they do pre-compiled image image container packaging, but then you just reference that they're re like not for devs, but you, you're saying that they there is a tool chain. To spread yeah, out there's there's more more, more work ongoing. Image, but they also have pre they call it pre jitted so just in time compiled. Yeah. So they've got lots of DLLs that they've already run through a native generation, so they're ready to go. So there's no sort of spin up time for those because they'll ship with some native code for the platforms that you're after. But sorry, is there a uh, build tool to spit out a Docker image now? Uh, there's certainly pipelines for that. Yeah, um, sorry, sure. pipelines. Yeah, so you'd be able to like, yeah, you can use the they, they Microsoft builds. Yeah, they, they provide Docker images 
support all their platforms, including the legacy.NET framework. So you can take that image, and if you use the same image, it will be shared across all your apps. And you can just deploy it that way. It's another option. And, and there's container services on Azure, which is what they're obviously wanting to use. 